Um, so the Google Cardboard is kind of a low-cost solution to um, VR, where you basically have a, a kind of a cardboard box or plastic headset you can basically turn your smartphone into a, a VR uh, display. And, and this obviously has way more potential to bring VR to the masses because there are about two billion smartphones already. So uh, cardboard uh, boxes a few dollars. So this has way more potential to bring uh, VR to masses. And you can see that there's already 20 million downloads of of Google Cardboard apps. So this is potential for me right now is that these interaction options are fairly um, limited. So the Cardboard only has like a, a button on the side, you can do some head tracking. So that, that doesn't really allow you for building very rich immersive experiences like you can find on the desktop market. So um, seeing some opportunity there, um, I decided for my lab to kind of try to bridge this gap between desktop VR and mobile VR and kind of try to bring some of these high-end interaction options to, to the mobile VR platforms um, so we can help bring VR to the masses. So uh, like I said before, the interaction opportunities of mobile VR are fairly limited. If you look at many of the cardboard apps that are available, they can like roller coaster like experiences or you know, you know, put your headset on and look and see, or 360 video. So these are fairly limited um, in interaction. So one of the first things uh, um, we, we worked on, and this is something that I did from a, a, a project um, that was funded by Google where we were trying to do indoor navigation using Google Glass. So we were trying to um, solve how to do step detection using a uh, sensor that is attached to your head. Uh, so we were able to develop a very sensitive step detection algorithm. And um, you know it worked in Google Glass. And then all of a sudden, Google decided to uh, to mudball the Google Glass project, so we you know, had all this really cool research and then uh, couldn't really do anything with it. Fortunately, right around the time, cardboard also came out, so people were wearing smartphones on their head and immediately they saw, hey, that's cool, why don't we do step detection so we can walk around on mobile VR platforms. So currently, um, existing um, games, to allow for navigation, you can either do something like auto walk, so, so there's a button at your feet, you, you select it with your head and then basically it moves you automatically. Now this is kind of known to kind of cause um, cyber sickness uh, because you basically have optical flow and this generates vacuum and your body is kind of confused because there's no vestibular input. Normally when you walk, you kind of, your head starts bobbing and it, your body communicates all this information. So if you get all this optical flow without that information, you get kind of like cyber sick. It's kind of the opposite of being car sick where you know you don't see your surroundings, but you do feel your body moving. So cyber sickness and car sickness are very closely uh, related. Another technique that people have been using um, is beacon-based navigation. So you basically select a beacon and then you move. But then basically your game world is kind of li limited to kind of a graph and you can't really navigate free navigation, which you know what's, this is what's available on, uh, on existing desktop 3D games. So, um, you know, I already had that idea in mind to use real-time step detection. But it was kind of funny. I saw this video on Twitter. Um, Google also has this program called Google Expeditions, where they basically go to schools and they have a bunch of cardboards and they let kids play with the cardboards. So I found this really cool video, and I was like, let's see what kids do. You know, kids are kind of um, unbiased. So look, look what they're doing. They're walking around, and you know, immediately they try to interact with VR the way they're used to interacting with the real world. So I was like, hey, that's kind of cool. Why don't we try to bring walking and running to, um, to mobile VR? So, uh, and I'm not going to go into the details. I'm just going to kind of quickly show you some, some results. So we basically developed a step detection algorithm, sort of my student Sam. Um, so basically it detects steps. And we kind of spent a lot of time actually optimizing this, because step detection with the sensor on your head um, Previous studies have only done step detection on your hip, for the sensor on your hip or your feet, and the further you're away from your feet, the harder it becomes to pick up those uh, accelerations. But we built a really sensitive step detection algorithm that works uh, fairly well, it's, it's suitable, and we also spent a lot of research on trying to come up with a way of doing, the most natural way of doing locomotion. So if you immediately start with a velocity that's kind of, that feels unnatural, so you kind of have to ramp it up or ramp it down. Um, so we did a, 
we'll use a study kind of comparing this with um, walking in place versus auto walk and found that the performance is similar because um, you know you don't have to provide any input with auto walk but but users significantly found this way more immersive and had a much higher presence and you know people ask me like well why don't you compare it to joystick input well joystick input requires an extra controller and also google cardboard they actually require you to hold the cardboard adapter with your hands in order to limit the rotation of your head so that's also another way of, of minimizing motion sickness so from, from, a, from a hardware requirement we decided that comparing it to auto walk made way more sense because it doesn't require any instrumentation so some results um, so we didn't find a difference in, in error rate or uh, performance um, there was actually a, a small uh, difference in performance we also kind of evaluated straight trajectories and curved trajectories obviously when you do auto walk then it's just a matter of steering where with walking in place you basically have to continue providing input but other than that um, uses uh, um, kind of um, certainly for, for, for preference and immersion they they preferred um, be your step it's kind of interesting to see that for efficiency, a lot of people and reliability, they, they thought that auto walk was more accurate, but the one of the results actually didn't find a significant difference there. So going from the feet to the hands, so um, hand input is also uh, you know, a very natural, immersive way of interacting with VR. You know, we're, I'm holding my cup here, why, why, why can't I do that in VR, right? So that's kind of a, a challenge right now. We don't have accurate hand tracking yet and even um, stuff that is available requires kind of a very uh, they're not super expensive but it requires an external depth sensor also performing computer vision is a computationally uh, very expensive so you know you're already running a 3d simulation on your smartphone now you connect the 3d sensor to it and you're also running computer vision at the same time your, your smartphone is going to be dead in like 20 minutes uh, just because it gets really hot and can't really run it at the same time so we came up with a really um, a simple trick, again, kind of going from this idea like, okay, why don't we look at stuff that we already have on a smartphone, right? So we already have uh, a headset with a smartphone. So I was doing some thinking, and I was like, hey, that's kind of cool. Um, there is actually, most microphones and speakers on your smartphone can produce audio up to 24 uh, kilohertz. But most humans can only hear up to 15. So there's like this small band of inaudible sound. Only dogs and kids can hear it. I don't know if you've ever heard of those ringtones for, for, for kids that you know, parents can't hear them. So we were like, hey, that's kind of cool. Why don't we use that little frequency range and kind of like use Doppler shifts to kind of estimate the velocity of the hand. So the user basically holds um, one earbud in their hand and then we can basically kind of estimate the distance of your hand towards your smartphone. And obviously this is a very, you know, it only offers one degree of freedom of hand tracking. Uh, here's a little demo. So to control the position of the hand, we basically tie it to the gaze. And so you can basically just like create a little game where you can grab apples from the sky. And, and so, you know, going from just like a purely button input to kind of like having a little bit of a simulated hand input, that's already a, a big step forward. Uh, we've also, right now, we're working on a way to kind of use existing speakers in your, in your uh, TV to kind of enable kind of 2D positional uh, tracking. So that's something that we're working on right now. So we compared this to button input, um, and although button input was faster, obviously you know it requires less effort. Uh, audio was was way more immersive, and you know that for VR is really important to kind of come up with interaction techniques that are more uh, immersive, even if they're less efficient. You know, navigating with a joystick is obviously more efficient than actually walking around. But but presence and immersion are really important for VR. Um, so kind of going beyond the domain of um, mobile applications, we, um, we were also kind of thinking of, you know, how can we actually combine, going back to this walking in place uh, locomotion technique, um, you know, maybe there are some applications there for the desktop VR. And uh, one of the problems right now um, with positional tracking systems like uh, available on the on the Vive and the Oculus Rift is that they the, the track space is fairly limited. You can track space up to 15 by 15 feet, but most people don't generally have that much space available for VR, and you would also have to clear out all furniture and everything. 
So a survey among um, Oculus Rift and Vive owners actually found out that most people just clear enough space. Some, it was something like six by five feet, um, you know, kind of the minimum tracking space requirements. So people generally don't have a lot of space available. And, and so what do you do then when uh, you kind of run into the boundaries of your positional tracking system? So what happened then is that people typically switch to an alternative locomotion technique. So you can do some very fine-grained navigation just using walking in place. But if you want to kind of go to a further place, you either use a joystick input or use a technique like teleportation. But switching from like leg input to a hand-based input, you know, that's kind of considered to break uh, presence. And it's also not very efficient. Uh, and I'll show you something that we found that it, what happens when you actually give people a controller for navigation. Um, so our idea was, well, you know, we've already seen from mobile VR that walking in place works best. So why don't we combine walking in place with real walking input? So, you know, when you run into your track, out of your tracking space, um, typically a grid appears telling you, okay, don't go beyond the grid. So can't guarantee collision-free navigation there. Uh, so you basically switch to walking in place. And then, you know, you could turn around and you could still do, you could very easily switch from real walking to walking in place input. And it seems really very seamless transition because you're still both using your legs for input. So here's a little demo. Um, we implemented this on Google Tango platform, which is a, kind of a smartphone with a depth sensor. For my students, so basically having a virtual environment. And then you kind of run into the drag space, so there's a grid appears there. And then if you want to go to the house, you basically transition to walking in place. So you can basically navigate at scale um, using a fairly limited um, amount of tracking space. So, um, you know, we're scientists, so when we come up with a new interaction technique, we obviously have to compare it to kind of like what is currently used. So controller input is, is most commonly used for teleportation. So we basically compared it to controller input. So we had people basically follow a number of waypoints. So there was like a waypoint that was far away, so they had to transition to a different locomotion technique, and there were waypoints that were close by, so they could walk to it. Uh, so we, we had a bunch of people do that. And then we found, of course, controller input is faster. But uh, zoom scale, which is basically your hybrid technique, had shorter paths. But one thing that we noticed that was really interesting is that as soon as you give someone a controller for navigation, we saw that over time they ended up actually abandoning positional tracking input altogether. So even waypoints that were close by that they could walk to, they ended up just using a joystick. And that was such an interesting finding because you know that could really fundamentally affect the design of, of VR games that rely on positional tracking because if people over time don't use positional tracking, you know, why would they even buy a positional tracking system or why would you even want to stand up? You might as well just sit down and navigate your environment with a controller. And so th th this, this was a really significant finding which I think could significantly affect presence in, in, in VR games. So um, one takeaway from this research is that, you know, Whatever locomotion technique we're using, we should we should ensure that we don't abandon positional tracking input and that we you know make it uh, as immersive as, uh, as possible. Um, <clears throat> so, also kind of uh, some some positive results. So, again, uh, regarding immersion and presence, most of our subjects preferred uh, zoom scale. Um, surprisingly, they thought controller input was was more accurate. But actually, zoom scale is more accurate because you can actually, with uh, walking in place, you, you have very precise control about your locomotion speed. With a joystick, it's basically, uh, we, we actually saw, if we analyzed the paths, that the joystick users actually s swerved a lot more than um, using walking in place. So it was, it was interesting. And then the last thing that I'm going to present um, is um, omnidirectional uh, navigation. So. One of the limitations of using walking in place is that you can basically only steer in the direction of your gaze. So you can basically, um, you, you basically only uh, steer. So let's say um, if I want to navigate to the stable and I'm a little bit too close, okay, how do I turn around? I can't move sideways or backwards, right? I gotta turn around, go this way, turn around again. So correcting 
your position using lock in place and using steering only is actually really difficult. So um, this basically says you know lock in place only allows you to navigate in the direction of your gaze, and since you only have one gaze, you can only navigate in one direction. Um, you've seen these nasty students here on campus with these uh, crazy, um, I forgot how they're, how they're called, uh, Hoover boards, right? So it's kind of interesting. I was like, hey, that's kind of cool. So, you know, yeah, using, your, using your, uh, your balance to kind of steer in different directions, right? It's kind of interesting. Why don't we combine that with walking in place and basically use the orientation of your head to kind of augment your gaze? So, another little movie. So what we did basically, you did an experiment where you just basically use the orientation of your head for steering. <coughs> That's just one way, basically just like you know, how a movement board works as well. And it's easy to implement, you just use inertial sensing, you don't need anything else. Um, and so basically you had users kind of go through this obstacle course. Um, and it kind of is a little uh, radical, it kind of shows you the direction that you're navigating. And then next, we also kind of augmented walking in place. So you can basically just walk in place, but then you can also steer. You can literally go sideways with your head. And uh, it looks weird, but actually, uh, I, I tried that many times. It's actually fairly natural. And one of the biggest benefits that it also, you know, the example that I said here before, where you walk kind of in a table, okay, I'm too close. Well, just tilt your head up and walk, kind of walk in place. You navigate backwards, and that is really very natural. <coughs> Again, you can compare this to controller input. Obviously, controller input is uh, faster. Oh, sorry, this is the uh, wrong slide. Um, we didn't, yeah, we did compare it to controller input. Um, we had three conditions. We had controller input, tilt by itself, and an augmented version of walking in place plus tilt. And it turned out that tilt by itself was fastest and also allowed you to avoid obstacles way better than joystick input or uh, walking in place. Uh, users found the walking in place with the head tilt to be most uh, immersive. I'm trying to remember what the other results were. This is just like fresh uh, research. All right. Um, last thing I want to tell you. If you're curious about research, you know, people telling all cool stories about robots, but you never get to touch anyone. Okay. Any robot? This research? Get your smartphone. Download this game called Gravity Pool. You just crossed 100,000 downloads already. It's a free game. It's kind of inspired by Portal, cool puzzle game, and it lets you walk in place using our navigation technique. If you're a game developer or a VR developer, you can also go to the Unity store. Unity is a popular game engine. We have an asset called VR Step, and you can download it, and it just using drag and drop adds walking in place to your game and lets people play your VR game without having to use a joystick. There's actually quite a few games already out there that um, use it. There's a very popular game called Jugger now in the Gear VR that uh, uses a plugin. Uh, so yeah, try it out. Let me know what you think. Hopefully you have uh, a cardboard headset and we can buy one. Um, I got 30 seconds left for questions. How do the tilt only and the tilt locking in place affect cyber signals? Very good. Um, so. Um, we did see we didn't see a significant difference in cyber sickness, and that's basically because um, one of the reasons why people get cyber sick sick is um, kind of a conflict between vestibular input and optical input. So when you tilt your head, that's also kind of like the natural way people walk. They kind of tilt their head forward, so that somehow kind of uh, alleviated the cyber sickness, the vestibular conflict problem a little bit. And with walking in place, you basically get proprioceptive feedback. And all of the studies that we've done with walking in place uh, have actually found that that doesn't generate cyber sickness to the same extent as when you use a joystick and you're just standing still and your body doesn't convey any information. So yes, walk in place, I'm a sincere believer that that helps minimize cyber sickness. But again, it, cyber sickness can depend on various things like head tracking and resolution and frequency. So it's just one, of, one way of curing it. Where do you see the role of like the Omni uh, treadmills coming in? Well, Vertrex Omni, have you heard of that company? They just sent out an email last week that they're not going to ship anything outside of the U.S. So I, I think their approach is doomed. Um, 
I've tried one. It feels like it feels like you're skating. You're 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 kind of like strapped in this harness. You know, it feels really weird. It's like you're. I mean, I'm a Dutch guy, so we skate a lot. I like skating, but skating for VR, it just doesn't feel right. Another major limitation for things like omnidirectional treadmills um, is that you cannot really combine this with positional tracking. So a lot of games that I'm playing on VR require you to bend down and grab something. You can't do that when you're strapped into a harness. Uh, plus, it just feels weird. Uh, but, I mean, there's plenty of people that have bought one, so we'll see. It's not, right now it's not supported by a lot of game companies, so we'll see where that goes. Uh, in the cardboard box when you were reading bag tracking, why don't you use the camera? Is that a computation limitation? And secondly, uh, you were using sound. Is that just a gesture recognition, or are you uh, accurately uh, tracking the hand um, of our hand? It's kind of a mix. Um, so why we don't use the camera? Because hand tracking on mobile devices, with a, even with a regular camera, is very computational and it depends on various lighting conditions and all that stuff. So. It, we just don't have the resources to do that. I know a lot of people are working on doing it, um, doing hand tracking, but you do need to kind of have a depth, depth camera to do it. I've seen some Kickstarters where they basically people hold kind of a giant QR code in their hand and basically use hand tracking like that, but I don't know. I think what we're doing is makes more sense and uh, you know uses existing hardware, not subject to lighting, uh, uh, lighting conditions. The audio doesn't really interfere with anything. Unless you have kids that scream their heads up, but and the audio is just you recognizing a gesture. Or basically, we detecting Doppler shifts. So in a way, it's Doppler. Uh, in a way, it's gesture recognition. So we basically, know when hand is moving away or close to the hand. So you do kind of start from a start. So we don't have actually absolute distance. Basically, a dead reckoning approach, but it works really well. We actually have very little drift. So thank you. Thank you.